Well, thank you very much for the invitation for this wonderful uh, workshop that you've done. Uh, I actually have the honor of uh, giving two presentations to you today, back to back with a break. Um, one is more of a tutorial uh, piece. It's a second talk on how to model hyperscanning data because I believe in social neuroscience we, uh, it's really a modeling problem rather than a data acquisition problem. And the first part of my talk will be um, about neural coupling in general, so all of basically the old work that I did before moving to uh, UCL this year. And it's uh, great that Guillaume was just here and introduced you to all the history of hyperscanning and made some uh, important points um, so I don't have to work uh, so hard on uh, making you believe how, on how cool and important hyperscanning is. Um, Still, so I start. I've been using this slide for many years to um, for presentation because it reminds us on um, what type of data we're dealing with. So I'm also of the generation on when we started hyperscanning a few years ago. I've been called a, a parapsychologist because I assume there's something going on between two brains who are obviously not connected, and I should do something useful with all the money and the scan time that I have. Um, so that has luckily changed due to uh, the hard work of uh, some people that you meet here. Um, but still, when I started, the entire knowledge about social functioning in humans and the social brain and the social interactive brain was based on tasks like these. So we like to use cartoon images or moving cartoons in some cases. Or we have subjects interact with avatars, so computer-generated uh, movement or rec we record videos of people, but none of these tasks ever include any form of direct social contact to another human being. Um, and that was really, uh, that is really surprising, um, given the importance that the social functioning has in, our, uh, in us. And I think, Guillaume, was it you that also mentioned the research domain criteria, uh, which is an initiative by uh, NIH to describe um, symptoms in um, mental health across diagnoses and to enable to uh, describe um, symptoms and uh, symptom clusters on many different levels of analyses. And they described four core domains of human functioning, and one of them being the social processes, uh, which are, if you compare them, for example, uh, with uh, un uh, other types of cognition or um, any type of affective uh, studies, and social processes and social functioning is largely under studies. And um, until a few years back, there was really a methodological problem. So especially on my background in psychology, so we're experimental psychologists and we want to control things. And uh, social interaction, by definition, is uncontrollable. You can't replicate anything. There's no second chance for your first impression, right? And it was so bad that uh, people like Leo Schilbach, who you heard about, uh, and you're working with him, I guess, uh, he referred to it as the dark matter of neuroscience a couple of years back because it was, uh, it was so difficult to study and it was so against uh, many things that we strive for in our experiments. Um, but there were a couple of brave people. Uh, first around the group of uh, Reed Montague who tackled um, the problem of uh, two-person neuroscience and in their first um, studies use um, the internet and have people in different cities actually playing games over the internet with each other and they termed their method uh, hyperscanning. Oh, this got killed by translating from uh, Windows to Mac. So these are the number of publications. I think you've seen a, a similar um, similar uh, uh, picture by uh, Guillaume already. So the number of co uh, publications has increased so much um, starting from, let's say, roughly around 2012, 2013. So this is the time when we really uh, picked up the method and uh, became better in our experiments and um, produced high quality publications. So hyperscanning is super new. We don't know uh, very much, but also I think this workshop shows that we're uh, learning really fast. Okay, I will present your work today from, um, uh, or data from the work I did at Heidelberg University at the Central Institute of Mental Health, where we had one of uh, a very, when we started it, a quite modern fMRI hyperscanning lab. So we had two fMRI scanners, two fMRI labs that were um, almost identical in terms of the hardware, and they were connected by fiber optics, fiber optic cables, and so we were able to transmit data back and forth between these labs in real time. 
and subjects were able to meet before and after the scan, so uh, get to know each other in a um, natural setting. And then they go into the scanner and we provide a live video stream for them during the entire task. So um, they, for example, would meet in a room and then go into their respective scanner and then see each other uh, in the video. They can technically speak to each other um, for, uh, because of uh, active noise cancellation that we have. Uh, which we didn't allow for the task because it's a mess in MRI when you start laughing and move your head and stuff. Um, and then, of course, they can perform tasks with um, and against each other. The first data I'm going to show you is from a cooperation task called uh, joint attention. <coughs> joint attention is a very basic form of interaction that we use um, all the time in our everyday conversations. You can also uh, watch it when uh, we're having lunch and you can watch other people speaking to each other. Uh, joint attention just means that you lock your eye gaze with someone and then uh, you look somewhere else and try to guide their attention uh, somewhere. It's um, the same, we, we use, uh, we point our fingers to um, extend our eye gaze and we use it to align behavioral goals and transfer information uh, to others. Um, also, children use it before they uh, make use of language and some of our um, clinical populations are affected in their performance and joint attention task. Okay, so our task was super simple. Uh, both subjects had to press a specific button, top, bottom, left or right, and we provided this information only to one of the subjects. And so in order to complete um, a given trial, one subject had to show the other, like, I know I got the information and you have to press the left button, for example. And then for control, we also had individual performance and so on and so forth. And um, after half of the trials, uh, subjects switch roles. So uh, due to the task, you can identify the role of a sender and receiver of that information that we gave them. And both subjects uh, played in both roles, uh, which is later important for the clinical data. OK. Um, I also have to speak like an old person and say, when we started hyperscanning many years <laughs> back, um, when I started working with the hyperscan data, there was not, um, we, we had the idea that subjects that interact with each other are somehow linked when they are interacting with each other. So as neuroscientists, we think that this link must be present in the fMRI data we acquire as well. But we had no idea on how to compute it, what is it going to look like, what characteristics uh, is it going to have, and what assumptions can we make on the data. <coughs> and so we try to stay as data-driven and model-free as possible, um, which started in my case in doing an analysis of independent components, um, which just very blindly doesn't have information on the subjects, it doesn't have information on the tasks or anything you're interested in, and just um, data in a data-driven manner um, separates um, your, your, the information or the data you provided in the underlying components or sources of the data. So you can think of it kind of like uh, what your brain does when it hears things. So right now you're hearing my voice, you also hear a little um, some noise from the projector and some other environmental noise, and it will separate these signals into some sources, and you can uh, then pay attention to more voice, which is just one of these components. And I use a special version of ICA, which is called Group ICA, uh, where I temporally concatenate so I fed in all the data from all subjects uh, into one ICA. Um, so I have uh, the same uh, the, the same looking components and the same sources uh, for all subjects and not separate ones. It's just a methodological problem that you sometimes have. And within these components or data sources, I then looked at the brain regions or brain networks. So this is what, what these components are going to look like. These are actual components from, from our pilot data. Um, I looked for those components who um, were active during interaction. So were somehow engaged, increased their activity, changed their activity, um, and not so much engaged uh, when people were, yeah, we can see that, uh, when people were performing the task alone. And within these um, networks that were somehow related to social interaction, uh, I um, went on the subject level of the data. So I had um, temporal, temporal data for each component for each subject, and then looked for a measure of coherence or so similarity in the data um, between subjects who were actually in contact with each other. Now, um, yeah, this is this stuff that we can't see. Um, 
something that Guillaume also talked about, which I cannot stress enough, and uh, I also pester people when I review their papers, is um, we have to test for specificity. So we, whatever we find in our hyperscanning data, we have to show that it's specific for uh, subjects that were in contact with each other so that we ne actually need hyperscanning, but also that it's just not some result of some shared environment. So for example, if um, I've recorded all your brains, uh, uh, all your brains activity right now, uh, I would find similarity also in your auditory cortex, which is just a result of you hearing the same thing. But it doesn't mean that your brains have anything to do with each other right now. We're just all processing the same input, right? <laughs> and uh, it's the same thing here. You for, when people perform the same task with the same task timing, then you will find a similarity in their data. <coughs> So I used the cheap approach, as Guillaume said it. I used the permutation approach, where I shuffled a pair assignment. So I took all the real pairs that were scanned with each other, uh, and I matched them with someone else. And all these individuals were doing the same task with the exact same task timing. <clears throat> they were all interacting with someone, and that is really important. Uh, but they were not interacting with the person I'm now analyzing them with. And I looked at the, uh, the coherence that they had in their data as well. And from that population of all possible mixes and matches of subjects, uh, you can then draw repeated samples um, and look at the average um, coherence that um, samples will have just due to the fact that we're all doing the same thing at the same time. And if you compare this to your original data or the, the data you're interested in, the, I call them the real pairs because they were uh, uh, scanned with each other, um, then you can find out in uh, which cases the, the, the brain synchrony between, in, with, between the real pairs was higher than that permutated data. So that's an empirical p-value that, uh, that you gain. And uh, when I refer to a neural coupling, I only mean brain synchrony that survived all these tests that I showed you before. So and only brain synchrony that is over and above general similarity that all our brain sig signals have um, are, in my opinion, meaningful, and I refer to as neural coupling. OK, so what do we find in the first study? We did pick up this uh, neural coupling, um, so form of synchronization that happens uh, only in subjects that were scanned with each other, that uh, only takes place when people are engaging with each other and breaks down when we're, uh, when we're stopping to interact with each other. And it was very specifically depending, uh, dependent on the um, activity of one brain region, which is the so-called temporal parietal ju junction, so this uh, brain region back here. And it's really nice uh, that this brain region survived everything because, again, the analysis was blind, so any brain regions had the same chance of uh, making it um, as the most important region or mul multiple ones could have been uh, important for that matter. Uh, but the temporal parietal junction has uh, been described in a number of meta-analyses that have been out there as one of the core regions of the social brain mm -hmm. that holds connections to all other regions in the social brain and gets information, for example, from anterior temporal region where information on uh, what an appropriate social behavior is stored and gets this uh, information from there or from the medial prefrontal cortex that monitors our social environment all the time. And so uh, TPJ has been assumed to be the region that integrates all this information uh, to enable us to infer mental states, infer, uh, do uh, theory of mind um, tasks um, and uh, guide our social behavior. And it's this region that is synchronized between two individuals when they uh, engage with, uh, with each other. And it's my favorite brain region, by the way. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, that was uh, the study on the uh, healthy population. In the next step, we went over an early step of our work. We wanted to know if this neural coupling that we found, that was, of course, exciting, but we wanted to know if it's at all meaningful uh, for the work we uh, that we're doing. Um, and if it's meaningful for uh, problems that individuals might have in uh, interactions. And so we invited um, a number of individuals with a social interaction disorder, uh, specifically borderline personality disorder. And uh, this is a disorder with uh, individuals that have repeated interpersonal conflict that is very severe. It's a constant up and down, very emotional states. So their relationships become really unstable and super burdensome for, for these individuals, really. 
and uh, at the same time it's an, a disorder that we will see a lot in the clinic. And uh, we invited uh, these individuals to come and uh, perform a hyperscanning studies. And we had, uh, where's the mouse? Uh, we had a um, number of subjects uh, with, that were currently diagnosed with a disorder and they interacted with healthy individuals. We had a very, uh, no, where is it? A very precious uh, sample of remitted individuals interacting with health and more control subjects. And other than that, the whole protocol and data analysis uh, was, was uh, the same. So, what do we find? At first, we were able to uh, replicate our prior findings of brain synchrony that is present in health uh, as compared to this permutated uh, non per data. And when we looked at the data from the patients that are currently suffering from the disorder, then we were not able to pick up this brain synchrony. So there was a, there, uh, there was a difficulty or the deficiency in, in the uh, neural co um, coupling. And to our uh, big surprise, uh, what we found in remission was uh, that the data looked very much like the healthy data. So we didn't find any difference between the remitted patients and uh, health. Uh, which is very surprising uh, because borderline is a personality disorder. So by definition, it's very stable across the lifespan. So if you look at your textbook, DSM-5, stable across the lifespan. It's not going uh, going in remission. Even so, yes, I'm sorry, you disagree. Where my clinicians at borderline personality disorder does actually, have, with proper treatment, have an excellent prognosis and does remit. It, it does, but only from the research data, not if you look in your textbooks. Uh, just research assumes that it's remits. Uh, sorry, I, I do it from my UK uh, data as well. I, mean, I, I just wanted to say that in this context because the clinicians who are working in therapy and that, this would not be surprising data, but it's extremely clinically important. And it's interesting that it's it, uh, 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 and uh, it, it should be more widely publicized. It is. Um, actually, we had a, um, these uh, borderline studies were done within a clinical research unit specifically on borderline. Yeah. It was the first and, to my knowledge, the only of its kind. Um, and we find the same thing in most of our studies. So we're getting ready to write a uh, huge more like a concept or review piece to show that because this is so now in this case science backed up uh, finally backed up the what clinicians uh, already knew is that it does remit and so we need to change the textbooks um, so that was really exciting to us because it showed us for neurocoupling also that it's uh, sensible to disorder state so it's picking up differences uh, from health to disorders, but also sensitivity uh, to, to uh, disorder category, but also to the state, so it was sensitive for remission as well. Yes, we have a question. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, what was uh, the neurocoupling you're showing, was it speaks still to the TPJ, or is it the whole brain? Yes, um, so what I do is usually, um, now not so much anymore, because TPJ is always the uh, only region that survives, is I feed in, um, all of the uh, components, so that might be 16 or 20 for your task, uh, and I uh, go through the uh, component selection process, it's blind, mm -hmm. uh, and then um, all my tests are also uh, FDR corrected for multiple comparisons, and then I only take the, um, the uh, coupling that survives that, only the brain region, and that, is, that was also TPJ mm -hmm. in this case, yes. Um, it's an important question though, because uh, when you change the task, so the, the social um, cognitive process, um, then the uh, component changes or there's multiple components. We see that in a second. Okay. Um, we did a lot of work on um, trying to validate neurocoupling. So the question is still out there, do we need uh, neurosynchrony for anything or what do we need it for? Or is it, is it the larger the better or is that some average uh, good fit and part of that um, work was trying to um, relate the neurocoupling that subjects ach achieve in the scanner uh, to some external markers um, for mental health. And in terms of predictive validity, validity um, in, in uh, psychiatry we don't have a lot of um, uh, variables that across conditions very good predict risk for disorders. Um, or the emergence of disorder or, or the time point of disorders. And uh, one that we're working on that actually that clinical research unit has developed into is we're looking at um, childhood adverse effects. So trauma load, childhood um, 
uh, events such as um, neglect or abuse, physical, emotionally, uh, sexually, and so on. And these are the best predictors that we have that uh, subjects might be at risk later on in life uh, for any type of uh, disorder and also borderline. And uh, this was actually uh, the, the uh, variable that was uh, nicely across um, our diagnosis categories related um, to the neural synchrony. So the higher your trauma load is, uh, which relates in everyday life to uh, higher mental health problems, then the, uh, the uh, lower the neural synchrony is that you have in uh, interaction tasks. Which was also nice because the childhood trauma is usually interpersonal trauma. Uh, which I think uh, will be important for neurocoupling too. So there's also other types of trauma, such as accidents, um, that might not be as closely related to neural synchrony. Uh, yeah, I usually do tons of tests to show that we are measuring something important. Um, what I showed you before is um, data from a cooperation task. And uh, when you engage in cooperation, then your partner can either also cooperate or they don't cooperate, but nothing bad is going to happen to you. Nothing worse than, uh, worse than a non-cooperating partner. And uh, our everyday interactions don't really work like that. So uh, engaging in social interaction can also have a, ne a negative out uh, outcome to you, which is uh, also important in, uh, in um, the context of uh, mental health. And so we looked at the different task as well uh, that um, has been used in uh, early hyperscanning studies, which is uh, the multi-round economic exchange or trust game, if you're uh, familiar with, uh, with game theory, where subjects just uh, send in, uh, back and forth uh, money to each other. And uh, when they're transferring it, we uh, triple it, we multiply it. And by cooperating, they can increase their uh, gain, their win from the task. And it's the payoff they actually take home at the end. Um, but it's uh, also a risky thing because at any point in time, each individual can decide to just keep all the money to themselves and go home, uh, and you're left with nothing if you trust it. So if you let subjects play that over a repeated um, amount of trials, then you have a nice development of the relationship between the two. So they usually find some level of trust uh, that they have in each other uh, under which they will perform. Um, so we like, looked at uh, this task, and to me it was also important because here we have for the first time some meaningful behavioral data. So in the joint attention data, they, they're either successful or they're not, and the task is so simple that uh, there's uh, no behavioral data to work with. But here we will have behavioral data. So in short, what did we find um, was the same thing. We find some kind of um, synchrony in different, oh, this got messed up also, I'm so sorry. So you're just gonna have to believe me. Uh, we find some <laughs> synchrony uh, in health that is not present um, in the remitted um, individuals and also the, um, uh, in, not present in the current patients, I'm so sorry. Um, but what's more exciting here is we have the that development of the relationship, the development of trust here that we can uh, work with an example of what you can do with this data is the work of uh, Gabriela, who is a colleague in my former lab. And she looks at things like um, the uh, be um, initial behavior that uh, one person shows in the beginning of a social context. So the, if, if you show trustworthy behavior in the beginning. And then if you take uh, the last few interactions and so, uh, show how much trust does the other then have in that person, then you will find no relationship in health between the two measures of the beginning of the interaction and the end of the interaction. That is because we learn with experience. So every time you engage with someone, you update your model of that person. Um, and uh, the relationship that you have with a person depends on all the uh, experiences you had uh, with uh, uh, someone else. And that changes dramatically in the case of borderline, where uh, you get the, the initial trustworthiness that the partner showed towards a, a patient is, um, uh, uh, is highly correlated uh, to, to the final relationship that the two have. Uh, so, um, they're not updated, they're not learning as good, they're not updating as good, which we can nicely frame in a Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian environment. Um, and this is uh, this me measure of uh, learning or uh, deficiency in learning, you can then relate to the neural synchrony also that they achieve when they interact with others. Um, I'm generally interested after after the clinical uh, work. I was interested in trying to figure out 
uh, why we synchronize with some, uh, with some people and we don't synchronize with other people. So sometimes you have a vibe with someone or you click with someone and uh, we don't really know why that is. And also in a clinical context, it might be worthwhile to be able to predict who's going to synchronize well with someone. And uh, in my understanding of all the hyperscanning data that I've looked at, is that it's always, it has something to do with uh, the perceived similarity that you have to someone else. So if for whatever reason, it's not actual similarity, but if you uh, feel that that other person has something in common with you, the synchronization will be higher. And I wanted to know if I can predict uh, neural synchrony between uh, people that um, didn't have actually social interaction difficulties, because that's uh, probably special groups. And so um, we invited people that didn't have any difficulties, but that might have some kind of dissimilarity or social distance, if you want to quantify it, uh, between each other. So um, we invited subjects that had um, a migration background and looked that, that these were studies in Germany. And I phrased this really delicately because we had uh, really problems publishing data like that. Um, so we had um, individuals with a migration background. Importantly, they were second generation migrants. So everyone was born and raised in Germany, same uh, education level, uh, university level education, and so on. And they interacted with uh, individuals, also Germans, that had no migration background. And um, if you want to quantify the social distance between two people based on a cultural background, then you can do it uh, with um, questionnaires that are termed uh, that quantify acculturation. And that will ask questions like, um, do you think that when two cultures are living in the same country together that they should mix with each other or should they stay separate? Or um, if you are from a specific background, should you take on characteristics from the new culture, uh, culture as well, or should you just stick to your former culture? And uh, you can quantify that in uh, a person with and, uh, um, and uh, without a migration background. So in a person with a migration background, it will quantify the level of how well they integrated, how well they are culturated. And a successful acculturation does not mean that you give up your former culture. It means that you successfully integrated both of them. So you take <coughs> new characteristics of the new culture and integrate it with the old one. And quantifying this in the person without a migration background means that you measure their general mindset for the integration of uh, cultures in their home country. And um, we were a little bit uh, shocked to see this data. We were nicely able to predict uh, the neural coupling based on the acculturation score of both subjects. So in an ideal case, you have a um, uh, well-integrated person with a migration background interacting with an individual that has a general mindset for the integration of cultures. And that is perfectly normal synchronization. And in the worst case, you have um, uh, a person that is not integrated interacting with someone who also thinks that cultures should not be integrated. And they will show no to, um, this was a newbie, uh, negative um, coupling. Yeah, and that is especially true for the trust-based uh, interaction. And also, the trust-based interaction usually involves uh, prefrontal uh, networks as well. So the component can include multiple regions. It's, it's not. Uh, always just one region. Okay. Just, just to clarify uh, what measure you actually use, because as you just described it now, it sounds like attitudes toward acculturation rather than acculturation. Because acculturation is how much you have you have actually adopted. Yes, yes. Whereas, whereas you're, you're saying <coughs> should a person adopt, so that's an attitude toward acculturation. Yeah, the occult, it's the, called the, uh, it, well, we translate it into German, but the acculturation uh, questionnaire, and for the person with a migration background, uh, it's the regular questionnaire, have you adapted, but you cannot ask that to a German uh, because they're... So is this from John Barry, the, the measure that you're using, or do you know? Um, okay, we'll clarify. Oh, I, I, can, we'll I can check it, I can check we'll it. Clarify there, sure, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I have a question also regarding the acculturation metric. It's related to one individual or... To no, the sum of both. Ah, okay. So yes, yes. So usually when I relate anything to neurocoupling, the neurocoupling score, in my opinion, is something that's between subjects. So you can't relate it to the age or the whatever you're looking at of one individual because it's something that has to do with both. Um, the same with the CTQ score or those things. You should usually use the uh, couple score because it's a coupling is a is a pair score. Okay. Um, now 
neurocoupling or some form of cross-brain synchrony or however you want to uh, cross-brain coherence is also a term that you sometimes read has been something like has become something like common knowledge there's been many many studies out now and um, I made a summary um, of some of the studies I find very interesting and also uh, qualitatively uh, good uh, studies that teach us something about when neurocoupling emerges and one streamline of that uh, research is uh, what Guillaume uh, showed is uh, learning, interpersonal learning. So if there's a student-teacher settings, um, learning different things from algebra <coughs> to uh, singing a song uh, or whatever. And here we know that um, interbrain synchrony during the learning process predicts the outcome. So better understanding of what was learned and uh, better uh, uh, learning success, so the um, number of things that were um, memorized. And uh, we're also starting to predict behavior outside of our experiments. Um, in one study, uh, they predicted pro-social behavior towards the person, so if you synchronize your brain activity high with some person, then you're more likely to help them. They, they staged a setting after the experiment where the, their, their task partner needed to help and quantified how much time and uh, and um, pain they were able to take in order to help the person so you missed your movie that you wanted to go to. It's a fun study uh, to read if you like. Um, in another study also by the uh, uh, Jiang group, they had individuals just freely talk, about, well, not freely, but they, they were freely speaking about a given topic and recorded their brain signals. Uh, and later on that group had to predict, uh, had to choose who will be uh, presenting the work, so they had to choose a leader. Um, and they were, a, a, by summarizing the synchrony that each, indi uh, that each individual had with every other person, um, they could uh, figure out who was going to be the leader later on, because it was the person who synchronized the brain activity the best with everyone. So it's not who spoke the most or who spoke the coolest, so it's the one who synchronized the best. Mm. Yeah. So there's a lot, uh, there's the now, a few interesting uh, experimental paradigms. Uh, I'm interested in mental health, and there's um, also a few, uh, well, two streamlines. There's clinical patient data, and another thing is uh, mother-infant bonding or mother-infant interaction, uh, where people use hyperscanning now a lot. And um, the first results are already super interesting and show us that um, also in the mother-infant uh, relationship, the the infant or the, the child synchronizes brain activity during learning, but also during learning who have, uh, of things that are important for mental health, such as emotion regulation. It's something we learn in the early days uh, from, from our parents. Also, uh, a study showing that uh, a stressed mother doesn't synchronize uh, her bra brain activity so well with the child, with all the following consequences that come with that. Um, we have some data, we have some uh, published studies um, on um, autistic individuals who find largely the same things as we do. So there's an impairment in brain synchronization in autism, and they were able to relate it to the amount of the, the, the level of uh, um, symptom load. So subjects who had more severe cases of uh, autism also had a higher deficit and so on. And then there were, uh, there were our studies uh, using borderline personality disorder. Okay, so I hope I made a point for you guys now that uh, neural synchrony uh, uh, is a thing that happens when we interact with others. Um, it is sensitive to social interaction disorders, so potentially useful in a clinical context. Um, we've seen different paradigms, and we're hoping to, um, as you see in my following um, presentation, uh, use it um, also in a computational approach and uh, align uh, Mike Russell work with, pe with work like uh, people like Maxwell um, to uh, gain some more insights on uh, the brain and social interaction disorders and as you said it, um, heal all disorders using hypersync. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.